much for coming out and braving this uh, wonderful Seattle traffic. It's always a pleasure, and uh, it's an exciting Freedom Series. You'll have to put up with me a little bit. I've got a cold, so you might hear a cough from time to time. I also may have violated the no weapons policy because I brought the gun show here in case any of you get out of line. <laughs> you got to watch out for that especially Shapiro, he knows better, so I'll be watching for him. Um, I am the moderator, so I put on my liberal hat. I don't really have one, but I try to, I, I have crafted a liberal hat so that I can, when I'm asking uh, our conservative panelists questions, I try to come from a more liberal perspective, uh, and when I'm asking the, the questions of the liberal side, I use my own head, and uh, that's how that works. <laughs> I was told, I was told after our first Freedom Series debate, which was the $15 an hour minimum wage debate, I was told by uh, the open socialist on the city council, Shama Sawant, that she thought I was very fair and very complimentary. And I thought it was either the greatest compliment I've ever had in my life or the greatest insult I've ever had in my life. It was one or the other. I'm not sure which. Uh, but. Uh, I have to give a special shout out to those who are on the less than favorable side of the gun debate today because, let's face it, it's much tougher to come out to an audience that generally disagrees with you than it is to come out to an audience that adores you. So uh, keep that in mind when you're applauding and welcoming uh, our, our uh, pro-594, uh, pro-gun control panelists. So please welcome the president of Washington Ceasefire, Ralph Fascitelli. He says he's been crusading for common sense on the east side for decades now. Our sister station, 97.3 Cairo Radio's Dave Ross. We should have had Dave Ross sing a song because the man has some pipes. Um, and it's wonderful to hear. And our cultural crusader, Michael Medved. <laughs> and last but far from least, the battling Ben Shapiro. First question is for Ben, the way, I, uh, the, the way I arrange this is I'll ask a question of an individual panelist, that panelist will have a chance uh, to answer. Everybody else will then have an opportunity to chime in. I only ask that we try to alternate views so that um, if, if one, uh, one panelist might go uh, over a certain amount of time, I might interject and try and guide us uh, to speeding along the conversation. Uh, but other than that, it's a rather free form uh, panel today. Question number one uh, is for Ben Shapiro. Ben, on the Piers Morgan show, you said, you said, and I'm quoting, I believe in background checks. Then Piers Morgan said, for everybody. And then you said, yes, for everybody. Does that mean that we should support initiative 594? What I said is that uh, philosophically, I don't disagree with background checks, and I think philosophically, it's actually very difficult to disagree with background checks in a perfect world where you have instant verification, where you can go in, somebody can check, and, and that's that. Um, the, well, the reason I don't support I-594 is because we don't live in that magical world. If, if background checks were universally effective, I think, again, it would be on a philosophical level very difficult to disagree with them because I think that everybody across the country can agree on the basic proposition that we want guns in the hands of good people or responsible people and we don't want guns in the hands of bad or irresponsible people. If, if background checks were, I think, more effective in achieving that, that would be one thing. I don't think that this particular initiative, which is 18 pages of, of mishmash, uh, which I've read now multiple times, and each time I read it, I come up with a new meaning. It's like liberals with the Constitution. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a particularly well-drafted statute. It's not something that, that I think is going to be particularly effective. And so again, on an ideological level, background checks sound great. On a practical level, when you get down to drafting, it gets a little more complicated. Ralph, do you think that's uh, looking for the, the perfect rather than the possible? 
Boy, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, it, we, you know, too many times I hear opposition talk uh, that it's not perfect and we're making uh, perfect the enemy of the good. But, you know, Ben isn't the only one who's in favor generically of universal background checks. Alan Gottlieb is in favor of universal background checks. Phil Shaves, who's the executive director of Washington Arms Collectors, is in favor of, of universal background checks. So I think it's a good start that would that, um, you know, if um, if we can arbitrate or get comfortable with, you know, what are perceived to be the kinks in this bill, that um, we might have something that we can, uh, you know, agree on. Because I think we all do agree on that uh, we're all united in reducing, you know, the gun deaths in this state and this nation. Yeah. Again, we're, we're opening with lots and lots of agreement, and not agreement about 594, but agreement about basic ideas and basic common sense. And look, um, there are some people who get guns who shouldn't get guns in this society. I think it should be pretty clear that the jihadi, um, there I said it, who uh, uh, killed a soldier in Ottawa, Canada, today, today, uh, should not have gotten the legal deer rifle that he got in Canada, right? In Canada, which Michael Moore says has such enlightened gun restrictions. Now, the problem here is actually having something that can keep guns out of the hands of criminals. And there's something that you, you gotta understand. The, the problem is not just the guns. The problem is the people. There are too many dangerous and insane and violent people roaming the streets, often sleeping on the streets. And that is the heart of the problem. Uh, it's, it, it, the, and any system of background checks that you want to employ is clearly not going to protect us as well as being a little bit more serious about keeping dangerous folks off the streets. Last word on this, and, and it's very brief, but this is a passionate thing for me because uh, my wife Diane and I have a, a friend who was murdered, uh, and, and, and incredibly brutally murdered um, by a, um, a guy who had gotten out of prison. While he was in prison, he had cut off the hand of a prison guard. Uh, he had a violent past going back to the age of 14. He, he murdered her within 48 hours of his release uh, from having spent uh, seven years in, in prison. That's a core problem. We thought we dealt with that in this state with three strikes, you're out. Uh, that's a problem that goes way beyond guns, background checks. It has to do with dangerous people, not dangerous things. Dave Ross, did you want to weigh in on? Well, based on what Michael said, you can turn mine down. I'm going to put it up close to my mouth. Based on what Michael said, since we can't control the weapons, we have to control the people. We have to control the people. Who should control the people, and how should we control the people? A lot of this has to do with trying to anticipate what people's behavior is going to be, what they're going to do before they've done it. That gets to be a risk to freedom, it seems to me. So what you have to do is intercept the weapon at that point, that it leaves the hands of the responsible gun owners in this room and falls into the hands of the irresponsible people where we then lose track of it, and it is then misused. Either that, or we should decide that we can live with the level of criminal violence we have and not do anything about it. Gentlemen, um, oh, Ralph, you want to add something? Yeah, I think... Um, Let me interject here. Uh, if you would, hold the microphone uh, about a fist length away and point it toward your mouth when you okay. speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're taking incremental steps to a holistic solution. And, and what I mean by... Which is, which is always imperfect until you can arrive at that holistic 360-degree solution. What I mean by that specifically, in 2009... Brian Judy, who's a lobbyist of the NRA and somebody I, I, I consider a friend, we, and we try to work together, um, the NRA and Washington ceasefire, well, the NRA said they weren't going to oppose it, which is basically um, allows us to, to pass it. We passed a bill uh, in Olympia that denied gun rights to those involuntarily committed 
uh, to state mental hospitals. Now, people involuntarily committed um, for two reasons. You're either danger to yourself or society. So there are three steps here, and I'll just go quickly through it. Set, you get first committed for 72 hours. Those people had gun rights. Then you get committed for 14 days. And if you're still perceived as a danger to yourself, you get permitted for like 90 days. Up until 2009, the people that were um, committed for 14 days or more uh, still had gun rights, which I don't think anybody in this room wants those people to have gun rights. The problem, though, is we took the guns uh, away from them they are on a database, the state database, but they can then go around to gun shows and buy a gun without a, any record keeping or, or a background check. So um, the parts have to work together. So you, I don't think you can talk about people in a silo and uh, weapons in a silo. They're, they're part of an integrated uh, holistic solution. Okay, second question. Uh, we'll start with you, Ralph. Uh, there's been a there's been a number of statistics used to justify initiative 594 but one of them is a statement uh, from the Washington Alliance for gun responsibility quote there's abundant evidence that background checks reduce crime and save lives 14 states in Washington DC go beyond federal law and require a background check for private and uh, gun sales um, I think there was a mistake there. I think it was uh, 16 states plus D.C. that require right. a background check. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a typo. But uh, the abundant evidence that's cited seems to come from every town. And uh, the Washington State Firearms homicide rate over the decade of 2002 to 2011 was 1.81 per 100,000. The rate over the same period in the 16 states plus D.C. was 4.05. If DC is excluded, the rate is 3.16. By comparison, the total U.S. rate, including DC, was 3.96. The total fire, uh, firearm homicide rate in Washington, 1.81 per 100,000. If it's the background checks that make us safer, why does Washington State have a lower homicide rate per capita? It's a complicated issue, and I don't have the answer to you. You know, it, but one of the things that's going to come up is why does Chicago, that has the strictest gun laws, have such a high homicide rate? Why does Oakland? Every area has their inherent rate of homicide, given the, you know, the, the makeup and all the other unique issues to them. In the case of Chicago, they're so close to other states, and the, it's it's um, I don't think it's a race thing. I think it's an income thing. The lower income, the more crime you have. Here's what we do know. And these are from FBI statistics from 2003 to 2012. Those 16 states that have passed background checks have a 38% lower death rate uh, from women from domestic violence from their partners. Those states that have background checks have seen a 39% drop in police. Uh, uh, killings. And I'll give you one specific example. We had an instance here about five years ago, actually, to the day. We had Officer Tim Timothy Brenton, who was shot right up here on Yesler and uh, in the Lesher, Lesh, Les, I'm sorry, Lesher and I think 23rd by somebody. That individual got a gun from a gun show, uh, um, directly from a gun show, because he knew there was no background check. It was a convenient way to do it. And if you're a felon, or you're somebody intent on a felony, that's where you're going to get your guns. So that's why I think, you know, almost unanimously, we, we agree to the concept of background checks. Ben? Uh, I think that it's it's easy to, to move to the holistic when it really is just a problem of the human. Uh, the guns are a tool just like anything else. And the, the reality is that the states with the lowest gun homicide rate in the nations are in order New Hampshire, Vermont, Iowa, Idaho, North Dakota, and Montana. None of those states have significant gun laws. None of them. The reason for that is because the folks who live in those states are different than the folks who live in states with high rates of gun crime. If you actually want to solve the problem of gun crime, you have to solve the underlying crime problem, with it, which, which is crime. Right? And instead of focusing on the implement that is used to commit the crime, we need to be focused on how we actually get the crime rates down. The truth is that one of the reasons that you've seen such tremendous declines in crime in some of the states that you mentioned, Ralph, is because across the country, we've seen a tremendous decline in the amount of crime in the country. We've actually seen tremendous declines in domestic violence, domestic assault across the country over the last 20 years in terms of intimate partner violence. We've seen a decline of 72 percent. I mean, these are, these are massive drops. And, and one of the reasons for that is not increased gun laws. Gun laws have actually been loosened in, in many cases. And especially at the federal level. The reason for that is because you've actually seen longer sentences for criminals. 
I mean, if you keep criminals in prison, it turns out one of the benefits is that criminals are in prison. <laughs> um, if, I, if I could, if I could ask that, just okay. one, one, yeah, just one, and it's a question for, for Ralph, really. Um, I, I think you may be surprised, uh, and you would probably be surprised if you if you looked out over this audience. And, and virt I don't think people have a problem conceptually with the idea of background checks. Uh, there are certain people who should not get guns, and I think we would largely agree on who those people are. Now, the the question really here is why it was, and you mentioned Alan Gottlieb agrees with that, and virtually all of the uh, the NRA agrees with that. So why was it so difficult or not possible to get a bunch of guys together in the room, your friend Alan Gottlieb and you and other people, and put together the kind of initiative that could have had broad-based support? Why was, why was that not possible? I, I just, I honest to God, do not get it. Can I answer? Please. Because there are a lot of cross currents on both sides. And um, if you read the paper today, you saw in the final part, and, and I like Alan Gottlieb. He is a whip smart guy. And I tell Alan, you know, he's a good guy who's going to go to hell. Um, are, you, are you saying that as a Catholic, or are you? Well, I'm not a Catholic anymore, so. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's a longer story, and you're taking me off my my my. my point Let's here. talk about that. Yeah, but, but that was good. Um, but the problem is, ultimately, I, you know, the Second Amendment group is fighting with. Uh, the NRA over dollars. And Alan's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, he's a pretty reasonable guy, but Alan makes a lot of money by stirring up fear and paranoia. He wanted background checks. He wanted background checks uh, in Olympia. And what happened, and I think all of us on the panel, we have different views, but I think we all, you know, roll our eyes at extremists on both sides. Because I, 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 I would guess we're pretty similar, generic views. But, but, and Alan, I think, is pretty pragmatic overall, but he's a businessman. And he wants to make a lot of money. The NRA is about business. And um, you got, you know, you got five million NRA people contributing f f um, $40 a year. Our polling shows that um, a plurality of NRA favor background checks. Uh, the latest poll by Elway that shows 60% approval for background checks show that 53% of gun owners prevent, uh, uh, want background checks. But answer your question why they can't, because there are cross currents and rivalries on both sides. Not, not why they can't, why you couldn't. I mean, this was talked about for a while. So obviously somebody got together in a room and wrote out this monstrosity called 594. I mean, uh, you, you gotta admit, I, 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 you, uh, were, were you, do you take responsibility for writing this thing? Well, you know what, I'm... <laughs> Sorry, you seem like a nice guy. Um, what happened, you know, and there's egos on our side. I mean, you know, Nick Hanna and I are on first name basis uh -huh, and stuff, right. you know. But he's not on first name basis with anybody, so I don't think that <laughs> intentionally. Um, but, but, you know, then the lawyers get involved. We, we because we're, we've been doing this for 30 years, we had a couple of lawyers in it. Uh, and they pushed, you know, we, we try to simplify it. And then a whole other set of lawyers get involved. And when you have that, it does become 18 pages long. Now, what I will say, though, is the first six pages um, were all definitions. So we, we are <laughs> trying to protect, and even on, and in a ceasefire, we're dedicated to gun violence. We support the Second Amendment. But like Justice Scalia said, that doesn't mean we can't have reasonable restraints to, uh, to reduce gun violence. But to answer your question really quick, there's a lot of egos and cross currents uh, on this. And Brian Judy, we sit down, we have a beer. He's a good guy. But, you know, he'll, he'll get a call from D.C. and go, you can't do that. And um, well, there's a lot of money ask, involved. Shouldn't we ask, since you've asked why you didn't sit down and do it, why didn't Alan Gottlieb sit down and write his version of an acceptable background check bill? Since he's in favor of it, he's certainly just as free and has probably more money than Ralph's group does, sure does to sit down and write a responsible, acceptable to the NRA background check. I, I think what Alan says, and I, 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 he's not here, I don't think, um, but... 
I think what Alan says is he was preempted, that he was willing to do that, that he wanted to do that. And um, He wrote 591. He wrote 591 after 594 was he already going to be on the ballot. He could have written a different 591 after 594 that had background checks in it. Is yeah, it but then it wouldn't necessarily... ...subjugating state authority to the federal government. So, so right. but I, by the way, let me just say, yeah, I mean, and this yeah. may not be popular here, I personally, and I've, I've answered questions on this pretty extensively, I'm voting no on both initiatives. And the reason I'm voting no on 591 I've already voted, as a matter of fact, so don't try to persuade me. Um, I've, um, reason I'm voting no, uh, no, no on 591 is I am a federalist. I, I do not believe that the state of Washington should have background check standards dictated to us by the federal government. For you. All right. Thank you. Well, can, I, can I talk to one point on that about 591? It's really interesting because here we have the state law of preemption that precludes individual municipalities for creating laws who couldn't even have gun bans in the park. And then Alan, in his, in, in his evil genius, then went the other way. And I think he's a federalist too. And you know, the argument's always been about state rights that we don't want the government coming in the middle of the night and, and with their night goggles and, and taking our guns away. Now all of a sudden he's got the federal government you know, protecting him. Uh, from the liberal boogeyman. So Alan wants it both ways. He's smart. I don't think he's going to get it. And I think there's going to be a lot of Monday morning quarterback here because this is going to be very close. And I think if the NRA came with spending money on this, they probably could have beaten 594. I think it's going to end up about 53, 54%. And the NRA isn't going to spend hardly any money. Uh, at the risk of sounding like Candy Crowley here, <clears throat> um, I will say that uh, in the Seattle Times today, uh, Gottlieb was quoted essentially saying that 591, the purpose of it was to make sure he'd be at the table to fix, if it passes, 594. I want to do a quick follow-up. The original question was not, why aren't people at the table? It was about the statistics justifying uh, this particular approach to gun safety. My impression is that uh, universally people would like to prevent homicide. And so the question is partly opportunity cost. Dave Ross, you're a crusader for common sense. Um, another stat that has been used, and it was brought up just uh, just now by Ralph, was that women are safer. Uh, in addition to the idea that in these states with the universal background check that um, that there's a, uh, where we're generally safer. However, Washington's homicide rate is lower. For women, I don't have the intimate partner details, but I was provided this. In the six universal background states and D.C., the firearms homicide rate uh, for that group uh, for women is 1.67 per 100,000. In Washington State, it's 1.03 per 100,000. If D.C. is removed, the tally in those six states have a rate of 1.17 per 100,000. They do not have a 38% fewer homicides and, in fact, have 14% more than Washington State. Now that's all females age 15 to 50 rather than just intimate partners. Um, the numbers on females 18 to 85 plus was also lower for Washington State. Uh, Washington 1.03 versus California 1.55, Colorado 1.52 and it goes on. DC is astronomically high. Rhode Island uh, was less than Washington, as was New York. The rate at which women were killed with a gun by an intimate partner, therefore, would be 38% uh, lower. That's the rate claimed, but it doesn't seem to be backed up by the data. So the, the question becomes then, is the background check, the money and effort and political will, are the background uh, checks the best approach to actually making a life safer for Washingtonians? Or is there an opportunity cost in terms of the expense, the hassle, uh, the infighting? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, this is like listening to the to listening to sports radio analyze a Seahawks game. I, I, I think that... The, let me summarize so, so it this support way. our sister let, station. Here, let me, let me summarize I, but, this. David, I don't think it's the, that complicated. Statistics never changed anybody's mind because you can... We've all learned now that you can manipulate them, right? So why don't we get to what the fundamental problem is? You have to prevent guns from falling into the hands of the wrong people. Right? And, and I think everybody in this room, the people I talked to during the reception, seem to feel the same way about that. One of the things that background checks are designed to do, I don't know if they accomplish them or not, are designed to weed out those who are felons, those who have mental illness, those who have uh, some sort of uh, anger management problem that manifests itself in terms of a, a, a protection order. So why don't we find out, why don't we start gathering statistics on where that gun first enters the 
hands of the wrong person and find out how it got there. Did it get there because people uh, left the gun unsecured? Did it get there because uh, there was a huge robbery of a gun shop? Are there certain gun dealers who are completely irresponsible in how they sell guns? And uh, then let's start enforcing it that way. I think we go, we go round and round about statistics and trying to compare states. There's, I don't think there's a, a social scientist in the world that says you can do a logical, controlled experiment determining whether a certain change in language saved lives or not. We don't know that. But what we do know is there are people who have these weapons and shouldn't. So why don't we just attack it from that point of view? So it was understandable. <laughs> well, you were able to come down to, yes, you think that this is an effective way of reducing the odds that someone violent would get a gun. And that would well, and it's that's better an than effective doing means. Nothing. I mean, the only alternative is to say let's let's give up and accept. Ben, a is that the only alternative? No, I don't. I, I don't think that's the only alternative. I don't understand why the why we don't have an alternative in terms of actually fighting crime itself. I mean, what we are doing is we are creating a whole new class of crime in which an enormous number of people who are not committing crimes other than transferring a weapon to, for example, a sister-in-law could theoretically be swept up by a prosecutor in that. Now, we've been assured by people that they are not going to apply the law as written in cases where they don't feel that it's necessary to do so. But the, uh, really, I mean, this... This initiative is vague, it is poorly defined, the definitions are poor. There are many holes in it, and, and the best that, that the state seems to be doing with I-94 is, well, trust us, we'll enforce it right. And if that were the case, if, if the, I mean, really, if, if that were the case, if we could trust the state to enforce things correctly, then we wouldn't have half of the problems with violence in the state that we currently have. Okay, forget 594, what do you want to do? What do I want to do, how, okay. How would you change the enforcement of crime to... Longer sentences for criminals? And regardless of the... And, and by, and by the way, you are willing to pay for, regardless of the expense. Yes, okay. absolutely. And and Dave, Dave, a, a completely different approach to serious mental health issues. Yes, absolutely. We, we, one, know, one, of, absolutely. one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we have right now, and people will see this going home tonight, that we have a, an unbelievable and unprecedented number of tents and a brand new Nicholsville right at the intersection of I-5 and I-90, and we have more homeless people camping than ever before, is because we don't commit people. And what we do is we have this idea that somehow it's virtuous to encourage people to camp on public property, so free which is destructive, healthcare. destructive to them. Free mental health care for those who can't afford it. Absolutely, and commitment, and commitment. Yep. But, yeah. but look, so, one of the things, and, and by the way, President Reagan, and and room and board. President, President Reagan acknowledged this. President Reagan did not destroy our mental health system as president. He Just damaged it as governor of California. And he recognized that that was a mistake. If you look at, in 1955, we had over half a million inpatients in state mental hospitals. Today we have 70,000. Okay. And it's not like we're is, a more sane this country. This is very important. Free... Dave, I, I, want to, I want to say something. Um, you know, I don't think there's any argument in mental health. We do a lousy job on, uh, in the state and nationally and mentally, mentally and, and compared mental to health. other countries, we're but, but, terrible. We do. We do. We do. And um, in all the easy availability of guns, it's a toxic mix. Here's the thing, though. We are not that violent a society. If you look at our crimes of aggression, rape, assault, burglary, we are no more violent on a per capita basis than Canada, New Zealand, and, and Australia, the other so-called frontier countries. What we do is have a four times rate, higher rate of suicide because of easy access to guns. So we're not... Um, because of lack of mental care. I mean, you just mentioned there's a lack well, of mental, mental care, care for people who are... I, 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 mean, I, I have it, mental ill people in my family. I, I, the care here is terrible. It's yeah, terrible. Everybody has mental health. Mental, yeah, in, every, every, I mean, they argue, and I believe, one out of five people are just not really mentally balanced. We all agree we have to do a better job <laughs> of mental, mental health. How many uh, are on the stage? I know. Yeah. <laughs> But this notion that we got to put everybody in jail, we're not that violent a society. And half the, we had overcrowded prisons to begin with, and half of them were there for drug laws that I think they shouldn't be in jail to begin with. Well, that's an argument about drug laws, but not about violent crime. I mean, the, the problem that we have in, in large measure with regard to crimes that are committed with guns are people who committed previous crimes, they get out and then they commit another right. crime with a gun. I just want people to remember what we've committed to here. So longer sentences, we already incarcerate more than any other country, so that will be an expense. Free mental health care, regardless of income, plus housing. Free, free mental health care for people who are committed. And Obamacare. Well, 
that's what we're getting to. Yeah. I mean, so no pre-existing conditions. Anybody who needs mental health care can get it. You don't want to get to the point where they have to be committed, right? If you could, if you could stop the problem before they need commitment, which is full-time, 24-7 well, no, housing. It's their responsibility to stop it before they need commitment, right. but if they need commitment, they ought to be committed. So, so here, here's, here's, I think there's a point, there's a, there's a key thing here. One of the bigger problems here is almost 80% of the guns that shouldn't be out there, aside from gun shows, come from these, you know, uh, illegal dealers. The problem is that the Repu illegal, well, not illegal dealers, bad dealers, right? I think you had Bullseye down in Tacoma and, and a number of deals. Most dealers are good. Gun dealers are good. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. But the NRA has all but neutered the ATF. Uh, all but neutered. And there are, it, it, well, we haven't had an ATF director for the last 10 years. We, have we haven't now. had an ATF director for the last 10 years because the NRA won't even the NRA won't even allow us to have a Surgeon General because because the guy uh, wanted common sense gun control. Well, the, the ATF is a little bit uh, busy smuggling guns south of the border to the drug cartels. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh. Where is the Regardless. Wait, wait a second. So you're talking about Fast and Furious? Yeah. So it's important to control weapons and whose hands they fall into. Well, when it comes to, they, well, actually, that, that in, in that case... No, it's important to control weapons and whose hands they fall into because those weapons were used to kill an American border agent, correct? That's correct, and the ATF yeah, knew by, it was by the going... Way, no the one, problem no was one the, the did government, not regulate those weapons. The government greenlighting particular right. sales to drug cartels... That is bad. If it's bad for the government to do it, it's bad for... Wait, wait, wait. I don't, think, I don't think that anybody up here, and we began this way, Dave, I don't yeah. think anybody up here opposes the idea that weapons should be kept away from the hands right. of bad actors. Exactly. We all agree. Okay, the question is, how do you do that? And I say right. that you do that by focusing on the actor, not the weapon. Yes. The, this whole idea... And this is about enforcement, so whose job should it be to go after the bad guy with the weapon? The government, of course. Exactly. So and not to provide the weapon to the bad guy. Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. And so which government agency and by the way, to go after bad guys with and, and by the way, to go after bad guys without weapons, too. I mean, right, we shouldn't wait until they have weapons. This right. idea that the easiest I think place we've to stop had a bad guys is to transfer a weapon is not true. Tremendous breakthrough right. here. We've agreed that drug cartels should not get weapons from yes. the government. <laughs> not, Medved, not provided by the government. Uh, Michael Medved, questions for you. Uh, in the United States, according to gunfacts.org, we have 300 million guns in the U.S., um, almost enough for every man, woman, and child. How many guns are too many guns? Uh, it depends on how many you can afford. Um, <laughs> look, I, 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 this is something, honestly, I don't understand. Uh, when, when I get involved, and I know a lot of wonderful people, I don't think they are uh, incipient Nazis or people who want to take away rights, there are a lot of people who just don't like the idea of their neighbors having guns. I don't get it. I, honest to God, don't get it. I, I think it's terrific if there are good, law-abiding people who are our neighbors, who, um, uh, who want to buy a whole bunch of firearms. I, what, what are people afraid of? I don't get it. If you are afraid of your neighbor, then you're in the wrong neighborhood. And the, the fact is that that neighbor, with as many guns as he or she wants to acquire and stores safely in uh, Northwest Safe uh, provided gun safe, um, and where, where they're stored with maximum safety and surety, uh, <laughs> say that they're not even a sponsor of my show, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, the, they will be now. Uh, right. <laughs> God willing. Uh, the, 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 the point is that, look, it, uh, it, it's one of those things where, uh, uh, honestly, do, do people, I don't, I don't get it. Do, do you worry that, and the idea that somehow controlling guns or limiting the number of guns is going to lead to a reduction in suicide? We, we have been dropping the number of gun owner households in the United States. It is not true that it has soared recently. It's actually gone down a little bit. And the suicide rate has soared. It soared. There are 41,000 people last year who killed themselves. It's almost three times the number of people who were murdered. Now, now it's, it's, that's a real problem. And that's not primarily a gun problem. We're back to mental health. It is a gun problem. Um, 
Four times as many women will attempt suicide as men. Three times as many men will have a completed suicide. And that's because a male will most likely use a gun to commit suicide, and they succeed 94% of the time. And women, because they're not familiar with guns, usually use knives or they use pills, and their efficacy rate, sadly, if you will, is about 2%. And this is, we're taking it off topic here, but those homes that have a gun in, in their home have five times a greater chance of suicide than those that don't. So getting back to this point, look, people have a right to have a gun. It is the American way. We're never going to change that. We don't want to change that, that you, you have that right. But I do get nervous when my neighbor has a gun. Because there are mentally ill people, there are kids that at age 11, you know, they're going to be the next Charles Manson, um, and you're not going to change it. And my idyllic neighborhood in Sammamish, we had three of them. Um, and the Journal of Pediatrics report in February came out, and they said there are 10,000 teens and children, 10,000, who went to the emergency room because of, of gun incidents. And under the age of 10, 75% of those were gun accidents. So the chances of a completed suicide and a gun accident, you know, are significantly higher when there's a gun in the house. Here's my question. Why would anybody be against a company developing a gun that could not be fired by a child? For those families that want that option. I, I, I don't think you should be against it. Well, I, yeah, again, I I, I, I'm not the one. Why, not the, why? Smart guns. Smart guns we're talking about. Yeah, I, I understand it. Smart I get it. Why was there such a reaction the when that... The when that I mean, if they can develop technology, great. Wh Same why fine. was there such a violent reaction against that company that tried to do that? A violent reaction? Yeah, yeah they were in, in New Jersey. Uh, I'm they sorry, were I'm not... They were, I'm, Michael, so you they were, they were attacked? I, no, there were, so there just, were just threats, so the, and, they yeah. were, and the company decided to drop it. There were two of them. There was one in L.A. So just so the audience knows what we're talking about, this is the issue of smart guns, which is actually ceasefire is putting on a symposium. Um, Wait, now, hold on. Dave, you're talking about developing a smart gun. Right. I'm not opposed. I don't think anyone's opposed to the developing opposed. a smart gun. The well, well that, if they are, then that's foolish. But the, the point is, t requiring smart guns or government mandated know, smart guns, no, that's a different story. Nobody, Give no, people a choice. Doing that anymore. Require smart doing guns. That. I said I, very clearly, I thought, if you want the choice of buying... Absolutely. If I'm, I'm in favor home. of freedom of choice with smart Excellent. guns. So they're not, hap move they're, they're not happening, though, because the NRA has clamped down on gun dealers and prevented the arrival of smart guns in this country. What legislation have they passed to prevent gun dealers from distributing smart guns? So Oh, they don't have to. The gun dealers are under the NRA's fo uh, uh, footprint. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Well, let me t let me tell you who's in favor of universal background checks more than anybody else. Gun dealers, because it's a lot more business for them. People are going to come in their door, and yet you don't see any gun dealers speaking up on behalf of I-594 because of the threat of of, uh, of the NRA coming down on them. Okay. I, I, again, the, I think I thought we had established, and and it's very important that we establish that the homicide rate nationwide has gone down. And and by the way, I am not at all sure that, it, in fact, I, I sincerely doubt that it's gone down more in the 16 states with background checks. It's gone down nationwide. There isn't a state, in the, not one state in the union, where we don't have a dramatically lower homicide rate and you know than why? we did in 1993. You know why? why do it, you think? It's totally demographics. It's totally demographic. It's, it's better problem. policing. No, we, we are do, because you look at every society, and as and gun violence is tied to testosterone level, and and um, it, absolutely, and uh, as we have an aging male demographic, then we have lower gun violence. You look at every society that's an aging dem demographic. Look at Japan, one of the oldest demographics. Gun violence is almost non-existent. Now they also don't have any any guns there, but everything else being the same. <laughs> Everything else being the same, you can look at state by state. Where the demographics get older, you see less violence of all kinds. Ralph, hey, Ralph, since that, that's, that's too broad. Second, Ralph, that's too broad. Not all young people are created the same. Ralph, since you brought up, no, brought up such, Japan, but, um, but, but does wait, Japan have a higher suicide rate than the United States yeah. overall? I don't think they do. Um, they, they do. No, so does Sweden. No, there's nuance here. They have a higher suicide attempt. They don't have a higher no, suicide rate. No, they have a higher, higher suicide death rate. So does Sweden. The United States is not by any means. We have an, a, a cascading suicide rate, and it's going up very dramatically. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the idea that there, there are all these nations like Sweden and Norway 
that have very high suicide rates, despite very strict, well, Norway does not have such strict gun controls, but Sweden does. And the, the, the point is that it just, it seems to me that, that at the very heart of this, and what bothers me about this whole debate, and I, I had confided to folks before, I, I find these debates frustrating sometimes. Because there seems to be, and you'll pardon me, a naive faith that you can fix stuff materially. In other words, with crime, it's not the people. Those, those are flesh and blood human souls. It's the thing, it's the gun. A gun is neither good or bad. A gun in the hands of someone somebody defending his family is a positive good. A gun in the hand of somebody attacking that family is evil. But it's not the thing itself. It's the way it's used. It's the hands it falls into. You, and we you, ought to concentrate you know, on people, not thing. things. There's a lot of middle ground. Well, this is what I was like about a, to say. I mean, but There's a lot of middle ground here, and the politics are preventing it. Smart guns is, is, is one issue um, on that. The other, we actually got together with Alan, and... Um, Dan Satterberg, Republican prosecutor, th three years ago, because we have a problem in Seattle, in this state, um, for youth gun violence. And it is against the law for anybody, I think, under the age of 21 to have a handgun. Um, and yet, nothing happens to them when they get caught. And they have to get caught five times before they have any really significant punitive uh, penalty to pay. And Olympia couldn't agree on this. And it wasn't just, you know, the, the gun grabbers. It was, it was the whole spectrum. They couldn't agree on it. And this is something that the Second Amendment Foundation and Ceasefire agreed on and a Republican prosecutor. You know, um, we wanted to make it tougher, much tougher penalties for youth who are caught with g underage, underage youth to have guns guns to be penalized and keep guns away from them. And we couldn't get that passed. I mean, that's political dysfunction that is really at the heart of this to a large degree. Well, I, I mean, I agree there's political dysfunction. What I don't understand is why gun control is always the number one agenda item. I mean, everyone on this stage basically agrees on mental health. I think everybody on this stage basically agrees on more penalties for people who commit serious crimes. Why is it that these things are secondary, but when it comes to gun confiscation or gun, or gun transfer or, or regulation thereof, which I think we all have to admit is, is at the margins. Okay, the evidence shows this is at the very, the best case for background checks shows that the evidence is mixed. Okay. That is the best case for background checks. Why are we messing around at the margins when the heart of the issue is really all these other issues that we're talking about? We, we, we agree on that. But here's, here's why... I wish it was number one on the agenda, but I wish it was in a pragmatic way. But here's the issue. More people now die from gun violence in the state than die from car accidents. And there are... 80% of that suicide. But suicide, suicide matters. I suicide agree suicide matters, matters but, to, but the suggestion that guns are responsible for suicide as opposed to the person whose finger is on the trigger of the gun is absurd to me. Well, when you get a 34% efficacy rate versus 2% for non-guns, and the majority of suicides are done by firearms, I think guns and suicide are a toxic mix. Well, if you're mentally ill, you shouldn't have a gun in the first place, so we we're back to agree. mental illness. We agree. So let's pass I-594 to keep no. guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. Uh, by the way, one of the things, and, and you see that's the same... That's all it did, by the way, we would, we would agree. That's on the not all that it does. On the suicide issue, you see the same kind of thing. Right now, I think they're, they're devoting $70 million to building wire nets on the Golden Gate Bridge. And they were partially installed, and they had the record number of suicides despite the wire nets. Uh, they had 46 people kill themselves by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge last year, really. And the, the idea that, again, you're going to fix these soul-deep problems, and if someone takes his or her own life, uh, that you're going to fix that by more background checks. Someone who is determined to kill himself. And, and most people, and, and you know how common it is, uh, Ralph, you, you do, for people to have multiple suicide attempts before they succeed. And it's not just women. Michael, you, you're one of the smartest people, and, and, I, and I look up to you, and I've read your books and all that, but we're reading different materials in suicide. Um, the materials I'm reading show that those people that have survived a jump off one bridge, 90% um, of them live 30 years later versus to the norm for the average population. So suicide is a mental health issue. Oftentimes it affects our returning military men. 40% are affected by PTSD. And if we can get past that kind of dysphoric mood they have and not make it easy for them, then it's not going to be a fate complete. So, so Ralph, let me ask this. Why does I-94 have to be an omnibus? Really, it's an 18-page bill. If, the, if, if we agree on all of these very minor measures, 
Mm -hmm. then why not start with the minor measures upon which we agree? Why is it loaded up like a, like a, like a shopping cart with measures with which a lot of people disagree? What do you think it's loaded up? We're going to get into transfers, right? Well, yes. I mean, okay. the, the definition, I, mean, I, okay. I don't want to get into the weeds because we talked about this earlier, but okay. yes, tra so, the definition so, of transfer is incredibly vague in the bill. So a couple of things about transfers on that. And um, one, this bill was modeled after Oregon and California, which have had... <laughs> Being from California, it's worked beautifully. Which has had um, hundreds of thousands of, of, of background checks, and we haven't had, there hasn't been one instance of somebody put in jail for a transfer. Uh, secondly, the key thing on a transfer is that you have to knowingly uh, circumvent the law. In other words, you have to be a black market uh, dealer. Or, otherwise, you're not going to be criminalized for it. That transfer issue is put in there to affect this individual to gun show. So gun shows are private sales. You can sell a couple of guns, but you had black market dealers that were selling 50 AK-47s a session against the law. Those, those people should have been, by definition, federally um, f uh, licensed firearm dealers. So it's designed at some point to present, prevent the bad guys from doing it. It's not a gotcha. Nobody wants gotcha for the average everyday citizen put in jail. And it will not happen that way because we have precedent in California and Oregon. Well, it should be. OK, let, let me tell you a little bit about the precedent in California for a second. In California, there are 30,000 mentally ill people who have guns. They have a grand total of, three, of 33 people, really, in the state of California who are, who are tasked with taking these 30,000 guns away from these 30,000 mentally ill people. Okay, We're creating a system that is either not going to be enforced or it's going to be over-enforced. If we can just trust the government, then why aren't we just trusting the government to do the right thing now? I don't understand why a piece of legislation makes them better at what they do. I mean, the government is not very good at what they're doing now. Why, did, why does new wording make them not suck? Because because part of the reason, part of the reason you have a law or initiative as a deterrent, that a government won't even be involved, that the bad guys won't be going to gun shows to buy guns, so they have to circumvent it. Well, but that's that's exactly the point. If bad guys are not going to gun shows to to, to with regard to Ebola, and for a second, this is a mild digression. With regard to Ebola, the federal government just made the case that they don't want a federal travel ban, right? Because they said if there's a federal travel ban, people will just find a way to circumvent the federal travel ban. Okay, do you see the analogy here? Yeah, I'm not going. There. I'm not going. There. I'm 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 here to talk about guns. And most people are law-abiding citizens uh, on that. So, you know, I think one of the reasons you have laws is a deterrent to make sure that people do the right thing. Well, I agree, but this is this is the attendant cost, right? If if there are law-abiding, the, the cost is a law-abiding citizen, for example, under the bill, who wants to loan a gun to a family member for purposes of defending themselves. The, the, the bill talks about if they, it has to be in, in the case only of the most basically emergency situations. Well, how does the government define that? It's undefined in the bill. Right, I mean, so, so, I have a, so I have a cousin, or I have a sister-in-law who feels endangered by her husband. If I give her the gun, and she says, I feel endangered, and she keeps it for a week, but the government only decides that she was endangered for three days, and the gun is stolen and used, then she can be prosecuted, I can be prosecuted, as well as the criminal. And you'll never be prosecuted. It's never happened So again, it comes down to faith in government. You'll never be prosecuted. There's precedent here. You'll never be prosecuted. It's, it's, use your best judgment and don't knowingly break then, the law. Then why don't we just pass a referendum that says, please, prosecutors, do good stuff. <laughs> Let me let me do a follow up. Let me do a follow up. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, can I here. can I ask why is this this person who is afraid of being threatened then become so careless as to allow the gun to go into the hands of a criminal? Because why she's not she home put all the time. Safe? What? Because she doesn't have a safe. She's borrowing a gun. That's if you have a if so you have a gun, gun safe, she presumably have has a safe. And how does yes, that she's make borrowing it? That she borrowed the gun. I don't why buy a safe when I borrow a gun. Why, why are you? This is amazing to me. When I went to the gun range. People there who were professionally trained treated that gun with what I could only equate to reverence. Before they passed the gun to me, they carefully unchambered the round. They showed it to me so I could see it was unchambered. They then said, I am handing you the gun. I am pointing the muzzle away from you. You are now accepting the gun. Do you understand that? And then you're telling me it's okay for this woman who needs a firearm to protect herself not to return it and secure it again so that Presumably the next bad guy can get it and threaten her? Is she supposed to do that every single day? Yes. That's the problem with this. We have a culture that... So you're going to prosecute her. He just said you're not going to prosecute her, but you are going no, to prosecute, I'm not her. prosecute her. So then what are you going to do? I'm not going to prosecute her. No.
But we're going to educate her. going to piss and moan about I'm it. Going to expect, I'm going to expect people like this to put social pressure on people like that to be more responsible. I hope she's it's, more responsible, but if she's not, you're going to prosecute her? No. Why are you passing the referendum? No, the, the point is, I would, you're, you're, I would you're, rather you're, have the government expend its, its time, effort, and money getting mentally ill, dangerous people off the streets yes. than going after this lady who doesn't properly store her guns. And I, I mean, assume, I assume that once the Republicans take over Congress in November, the first thing, I want to get applause at least once during this evening. <laughs> I assume the first thing they will do is to pass the Michael Medved, Ben Shapiro, Universal Mental Health Involuntary Commitment Hospitalization Act. I certainly uh, hope not. I, not I, by the way, not I'm a federalist. A That's a state yeah, issue. <laughs> it should. Fine. We don't want when federal mental hospitals. I want so to let's take over up. Olympia. I want to do a follow. This is at once the hardest job I've had and the easiest. Uh, <laughs> they should have brought me a lounge chair up here. Uh, it would have been nice. Ralph, you mentioned earlier that they won't prosecute and uh, that prosecutors will do their best. There's an intention factor, but yet in schools we have zero tolerance for, for guns and there doesn't seem to be a lot of common sense there when kids are bringing one-inch G.I. Joe guns to school that are plastic and they're getting suspended or a squirt gun or they happen to forget that there's a, a pocket knife from their grandpa on their backpack and they're getting suspended. If we can't uh, trust common sense when it comes to the kids, why would we expect common sense from the prosecutors? I'm not defending the schools. I agree that that's overly politically correct. But, but in this case, you've got a Republican prosecutor, Dan Satterberg. Hold on now. Who has said transfers are not, not an issue. Hold on. Let him we, speak. We have Let him the finish. precedent of California and Oregon, 15 years of experience where transfers have not been an issue. And we know to have a felon the, uh, actually take place, or somebody be charged by a felony, that you've got to knowingly break the law. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this is a lot of kind of gutcha stuff, I think, by the other side of why we shouldn't pass a common sense measure that generically we all seem to agree with. So, speaking Ralph, of, if, speaking if, if we of, do of gotcha stuff, I want to, uh, I have challenged the left side now a couple of times. I've got to get back to uh, Ben Shapiro and the Piers Morgan show. Ben, on the same I'll episode of the Piers Morgan show, the now defunct we invited Pierce Morgan to come show. tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> you said that you would favor a national database of gun owners as long as it wasn't public. Do you still favor that? I have to admit I'm torn on the issue. I have to admit I'm torn on the issue. The reason that I didn't want it public is because we've seen situations in which newspapers have actually published full out lists of where the guns are, which of course is incredibly dangerous. Uh, the, there, there are a couple reasons why I have my doubts about a national gun database, and again, I, the, I'll, I'm honest here, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm torn on it. The reason that I have a couple of doubts on the issue is, number one, the government sucks at keeping things secret. <laughs> and so even if they have a secret database, that will remain secret so long as you know, nobody's hacking into their computer, or there's no Edward Snowden there downloading the information, or there's nobody who is at the IRS deciding to send out that information. Um, and so that has given me my doubts on, on that particular score. Um, I, I'm also uncomfortable with the idea, as a general matter, of the government having that much information about law-abiding citizens as a general rule. Now, on the other hand, and I said I'm torn, on the other hand, I think that, you know, I, I obviously, th this, is, this is the whole battle with gun control, is trying to find the middle ground that we're all trying to seek up here, I think, that, uh, that allows the government to go after the bad guys. They at least have to know who the bad guys are so they can take the guns away from them. And so that is where I'm torn. Do I think that a national gun registry is going to, the costs outweigh the benefits? I'm having a hard time seeing how the benefits outweigh the costs at this point. Um, but again, if the government could show me differently, if, there, if, if I could see evidence that the government is suddenly capable at its job, then maybe I would change my mind. Ralph, would you support that, or Dave? I, I think it can be handled culturally. I think it can be handled by making sure all gun dealers are responsible gun dealers. I don't think anybody in this room wants to give a gun or a bazooka or a grenade to anybody who is not qualified to own one. Let me ask a philosophical I, 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 question. I, I do want to answer that, though. Sure. You know, I th believe it or not, we work hard at Seafire to find middle ground, and we 
we support the Second Amendment. We support the right of lower abiding citizens to have guns. We don't want a gun registry. It's such a toxic, toxic issue that that would take up all the oxygen in the room and prevent us from doing some of these common th things we want to do, like smart guns, like making it tougher for underage uh, teens to have guns, that um, the noise that it would generate would, would, would not be beneficial in the long run to this issue. If Washington Ceasefire doesn't want a registry, why is information kept after the background check in Initiative 594? Uh, you know what? Actually, the data has to be torn up in 24 hours. If you look at the bill, the data has to be torn up in 24 hours. So there's no saving that, even the, mm -mm, even the gun transfer? Not allowed to save it. No. Because it looks like when they transfer any weapon, it goes through a gun dealer and it would be... We went, back, we went over backwards to transfer. protect Second Amendment rights. The information uh, has to be destroyed in 24 hours. If I, can I, this is, you'll pardon me for jumping in, but um, Ralph, let's say that uh, election day comes and you're predicting 53%. Let's say you get this passed with 53%. Uh, do we then have perfect gun laws in the state no. of Washington? No. Or w no. what, what next? What, what's the next agenda item for Ceasefire Washington? Well, one of the things is, I guess, the universal background checks does provide a platform to make the things we've done in keeping guns away from the mentally Hill, ill to be more effective. We have a smart gun symposium. We are terribly excited about smart guns because it does address the suicide issue. But, but that doesn't bigger. require legislation, does it? Yes. Well, why? why it, if, it, if somebody wants to produce a smart gun and sell it, why does it require legislation? I don't get it. Is pressuring gun dealers. Okay, then then we have we have smart gun technology. We have a company called Armatrix that was headquartered in Germany. It's now in Thousand Oaks, California. They cannot sell a gun because there's not a gun dealer in this country that will take on the NRA. Two of them. Can they tried sell it on the internet? Huh? With background checks? No, no because no. 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 Yeah. Well, right, but yeah. Why don't you invite them to a gun show? That's a great idea. Well, it, it won't happen because people like Washington Arms Collectors and Newsom are not going to go against the NRA. So the NRA is, has so a I'm lot of power. No, on a legal level, what does the legislation look like then? Well, I think the legislation might have to argue for free trade for smart guns, that you can't preclude uh, the sale of smart but aren't, guns. Aren't, the, aren't, these, aren't these dealers involuntary economic relationships with the NRA? I mean, what, so in you other know, words, you'd you have know, to criminalize the NRA. Gun manufacturers and gun dealers all march in line to what the NRA tells them what to do. Oh, yeah, then you're naive if you R think Ralph, otherwise. Ralph, hold on, hold on. The NRA, oh, hold on. The, the NRA, hold on, hold on. The NRA is hold not on, putting... Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. The NRA Wait, is... Hold on. No swearing from the audience, please. <laughs> this will be broadcast, and the only person you're punishing is the poor producer who has to go back in and leave back. So don't uh, do that. The, the Use point I'm making is Bolshevik or <laughs> some yeah. other euphemism. Go ahead, Ben. Here, here, here is the point. As a factual matter, the NRA is not putting a gun to the head literally, of any of the people that it is working with. The government would be putting a literal gun to the head of the people who are working with the NRA. Uh, ben, let me, let me tell you an instance of two gun dealers, one in Baltimore, I think it was actually Bethesda, and one in Thousand Oaks, wanted to sell smart guns. They had NRA pickets all over them. They had death threats. They were essentially shut down. It's on YouTube. Look at smart gun dealers. They had to back off because of pressure from the NRA. Does the NRA not have the right to picket? I mean, we have a First Amendment in this country as well as a Second Amendment. Why, we, we, why we, would they pick it, though? I but, understand. But I, we, I don't want legislation, but why would they pick it? I agree it with makes you. no sense. It I agree with no, you, but here, they have here's, the right to. Here's an opportunity. Look, let's all come together. Let's sing Kumbaya. Let's all invest in a great big new supermarket of smart guns. It'll be called Smart Guns. And all of a sudden, if, assuming that this technology works so well, this will be the only place in Washington you can buy them, you can buy them mail order, you'll make a bundle. This is an opportunity to earn a lot of money for Ceasefire Washington by opening Smart Guns Washington right in downtown Seattle. We, we, we are doing exactly that. We have a symposium. <laughs> in January, we're doing the Washington Technology Association, and for those people that don't know what a smart gun is, it's a variety of technologies. Some of it biometric, some of it is a digital handshake, some of it is like a, an iPhone uh, password, but only the owner, only the owner can shoot it. So 
it'll prevent you know childhood accidents which are important it'll prevent to some degree suicides by uh somebody who's not the owner um is it more expensive than a gun, gun dumb gun wanted. is gun it more is it more expensive than a gun dumb gun it be more, but it's, it's free market Right. It's so, right. so let people buy it if they want it. Well, tell that I, to there are probably NRA. some people the here tonight who are ready to order. The sale of smart guns. Go on YouTube and look at smart gun dealers, and you'll see some guy from Bethesda who has a bottle of gin there while he's crying in his gin because he, he doesn't understand it's a free market system and the NRA won't let him sell smart guns. It's, 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 it's still a free market if the NRA pickets you. It not if, not if they a, do death threats. You know, is, I, is, I is, is, is there a free illegal. market if the KKK pick at you? I mean, you reach a point that is just horrific. Wait, are you, are you equating the NRA to the KKK, really? I can make a longer argument. No, I'm not doing that. Thank you. But, but what the NRA is doing is making death threats on legitimate gun dealers who want to sell smart guns. That's a hell of an accusation. That really it's is. It's true. Go on YouTube and you can see it. Uh, follow up, follow up question to that statement. Death threats. It's a gun dealer. Death threats are against the law. Why would the Obama administration and Eric Holder not prosecute the, uh, if there was truly death threats there? Because they can't find an ATF director to carry out their mission. Because the NRA has prevented hiring of an ATF director. Wait, 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 hold on. The ATF director is not a prosecutor. The DOJ prosecutes crime. Be, be, because no gun dealer is going gonna, is gonna to call Wolf on this because he would be uh, an internet. outcast in the gun community. Next, next, have, question, have, is for, I mean, next question is for Michael Medved. Doesn't mean it's a crime. Michael, um, we have, we've had a number of incidents that have really uh, torn the American uh, public and had, I think, everybody in agreement in terms of sadness, sorrow, and outrage. That includes Columbine. That includes the attack on the Aurora Theater. Um, Dave Ross and I were on the air together when the Newtown Massacre broke, and it initially the announcement was that there was just two adults shot, and as we progressed through the hours, we uh, kept hearing about the slaughter of, of little school children. How is it that those incidents are not in themselves arguments for gun control? Well, they, they are. Columbine. The I'm asking Michael. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a <laughs> challenge to the conservative oh, okay. side there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you I'll, say, Ralph, I'll tell you how they're hand. not an argument. Let's focus on Newtown for a moment. Uh, the, the guns that were used at Newtown were purchased completely legally by the mother of the perpetrator. I don't want to say his name. And that perpetrator broke into his mother's cabinet and stole the guns and took them and used them. There has not been a single, not one proposal in the Congress of the United States or in the state legislature of Connecticut where if that proposal had been adopted, it would have prevented that tragedy. The only thing that would have prevented that tragedy would have been uh, getting a commitment and a long-term commitment for a clearly very disturbed and very violent and very dangerous young man. Or someone on premises with a gun. A a actually, there's a, a new bill. There's a new bill that I think passed both houses of the California legislature in the wake of the Isle of Vista shooting. Yeah, and it's a good bill. And is that if, if you know somebody, and it were, I think it would have prevented the Racer Cafe of uh, tragedy, if you know somebody to be mentally dangerous to society, be mentally ill, you can partition some third party, some judgeship, to make sure guns are taken away from the individual. And I think that's something we all agree on. And, and by like the way, that, that bill here. was passed with bipartisan support, as yeah, you know. And it should happen here. And I think that could have helped Sandy Hook, that could have helped Racer Cafe, where the, father, the individual's own father said, this guy shouldn't have had a gun, but there's nothing we could have done legally to prevent him from having a but again, weapons But again, it's actually a commitment bill, not even a gun control bill. Well, right, whatever you want to call it. A, they, well, they can, or, they can petition a judge to determine mental illness. So, so it's, the, 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 the gun, point gun. of stoppage is not at the gun transfer. The point of stoppage is long before the gun gets transferred. Our shared mission is to reduce to some 32,000 gun deaths in this, in this country, whatever you want to call it. You know, I mean, let's find common ground. Let's do this. I think smart we all agree thing. on this particular bill. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that answers. The... I've got two ex wives. What do we do with them? <laughs> <laughs> Call Dr. Probably Roy keep Show. guns out of their hands. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next question for Dave Ross. Uh, Dave Ross, as a progressive guy. 
Why is showing ID when you vote a burden on your voting rights, but not a waiting period ID and a background check a burden for your Second Amendment rights? I, I, I think it is a burden. Having a driver's license is a, a burden. Having to carry an ORCA card is a burden. Uh, but that's just part of what you do in a society. So I don't, I don't see what the problem is there. Oh, I can read you Justice Scalia's opinion. Yeah. If you want. Please yeah. don't. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, you, um, there's no Second Amendment violation in requiring reasonable restrictions. You can also determine that certain weapons are considered too unusual to be allowed uh, I, in the general population. Dave, I, I think, that, I actually don't know your position on this. Are, are you pro voter ID? Am I pro voter ID? Yes. No. So that's, I, think that's, I think that's David's question. If you're, if, why is but it that you it's wouldn't... Not because of the, it has nothing to do with the hassle. It's because of the way it's been used to disenfranchise voters. Well, wait, no, but, the, but, the, but this is the, but this is now, the point. Now, you're talking about voter... Now, I identify myself, at least back when we were able to vote in person, I identified myself because I signed my name in front of a poll worker under penalty of birth. I mean, I don't, I don't okay, really want wait, to... Dave, here's, here's a question. If, if uh, IDs are particularly... Uh, unusual, which is one of the claims in minority communities, wouldn't requiring showing ID to purchase a gun be discriminatory? If it's true for about voting, isn't it discriminatory in terms of people's Second Amendment rights? Well, I don't, I see absolutely no similarity between yeah something that allows you to vote and something that allows you to purchase a, a No, firearm. no, but the claim, the claim about voter ID, and you just made it, yeah. is that it's somehow discriminatory to require people to show ID to vote. If it's discriminatory to show... I didn't the, say it was discriminatory. I said it was unnecessary. In the no, way. no, you said it suppressed disenfranchising. You said it was discriminatory. Well, I said disenfranchising. Okay. But I don't say it's discriminatory. So, it's a different word. It's there, your right to vote is inherent. It's an inherent assumption of democracy. So, so your right to bear arms. Okay. Yeah. Well, right fine. I mean. so it is, and the Supreme Court has, has determined that as part of that, there can be reasonable requirements on who can own a gun. Right. And by the same token, there can be reasonable requirements on there certifying are. that you are the person you say you are when you go Michael, in and vote. Michael, Michael. In other words, I'm, I, Dave, you're acting Dave, as if I am, you're, I am perfectly you consistent. Your I am perfectly consistent. Do you sign your ballot? I do, sure. Well, then what's the deal? I okay, don't have to, here I, in this state, it's not because we have an all-male ballot. It is, it is not a deal, but I think it is too, I, I happen to believe it is perfectly reasonable for those states that want to require an ID for voters, to require an ID for voters, just as they require an ID if you want to purchase a firearm. Okay, I, I mean, that sounds fine. I don't, see the, I don't see the equation there at all. You have to identify, you can't vote twice. We have signature requirements. I don't have to show a license when I vote by mail. They have machines that examine that apparently. And when I voted in person, I did show an ID. There was no problem there. The problem is when you, the states where this is being required, in many cases, it's being used apparently deliberately to try and make it more difficult for some people to vote. Okay, there's, and, there's no me, evidence of that. And I'm tell sorry, me how that's many, wrong. Plus, we're talking about a problem that, first of all, it doesn't cause deaths. We're not talking about something that is involved in causing people to Okay, die. Uh, Dave, I don't want to. I don't want to get sidetracked. But in in Minnesota, in the congr in the senatorial election six years ago between Al Franken and Norm Coleman, yes. they they in at, they certified that at least 900, at least 900, which would have made the difference in the election for the United States Senate, and not given the 60th vote um, on Obamacare. That election was determined by felons who had no right to vote. And the reason they didn't throw out the election is because you have no way of knowing whether all of those felons who cast improper ballots voted Democratic. I have my suspicions. Uh, but Michael, why, why are you going off this on, on, on ID? I mean, don't you want to keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill? Yes, I have no problems. That? Look, I have no problems well, with showing ID. I how show ID that? when I go on an airplane, when I get a check, cash a check at a bank. I show ID. I don't see that this is a, somehow an assault on democracy. This is a mantra of President Obama and Attorney General Holder, and I think it's shameful. Because it's been used to take the vote away from the black man. That's why. Okay, can we, can we, there is zero evidence if you actually look at the voting patterns 
if you look at the voting patterns the last couple of years, in both 2008 and 2012, voter turnout was higher among African Americans than any other ethnic group. And that is despite the fact that voter ID, in some form or another, applies in 32 states. That's because African Americans need the, you know, and it's, a, it's not a race issue as much, it's, a, it's an income issue, and I, you know, they need the help of the government. But generally speaking, it is a tool by the white man to keep the black man repressed in okay. these key southern states. All right. Hold it, okay. hold it, hold it. I tell you what, Hold David, we've got as a, a result... One second, we've got a... a oh, broad, I do have, a, I do have, a, a, I do have one question about that. I, I do have one question I'm going to ask that. microphone control for a moment. We've got a broadcast okay. coming up, so while I appreciate enthusiastic audience response, <laughs> I, we only have about 20 minutes left. We've got a few more questions to get to. So let's, if you have to groan, do it short. Do a quick <laughs> groan. Okay. May, may, I, may I just say that after hearing Michael's compelling argument, I will cave on voter ID if he will cave on the gun issue. I, 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 on, on what? On what part of the smart guns? I'm for smart guns. Yeah. In terms of showing ID, yes. I am absolutely, I believe that it is not discriminatory, it is not wrong. You sh must show, you should show ID before you purchase a gun. There we go. So good. And by the way, I let don't me, think the NRA let, opposes let, that. Let me do, before we uh, end up in, changing the entire topic to voter ID, <laughs> let me do a follow-up. That's follow for the up. next one. Let me do a follow-up with, uh, with Ralph here. Uh, police response time, this is from the New York Times recently, the uh, police response time in Detroit, uh, with the Detroit median income, we should establish, because you said there's a socioeconomic problem, Detroit's median income for households is 26995 Sorry, Dave Ross, we're going to do some stats here. Uh, Gross Point Park, median household income, 101094 uh, those two uh, I, I know where you're going on order this. each other, right? Police response time for Gross Point Park is 3.4 minutes. In Detroit, Precinct 4 bordering Gross Point, it's 30 minutes. Wealthy people can afford more of their own security. When you increase costs of gun ownership, aren't you placing an unfair burden on the right of the poor to defend themselves? The, the, the notion that a gun is an effective deterrent is lunacy. <laughs> According to Dr. David Hemingway, according to Short. Dr. David Hemingway, director of um, injury prevention at the Harvard School of Public Health, when there's a gun in the home, you're 22 times more likely to kill a family member or a friend than an intruder. First of all, we don't have boogeymen, you know, breaking and entering houses with the purposes of of, of killing people as v that often. You know, and the is. danger, and the danger created by a, by a gun that you can shoot accurately in the middle of the night is far overstated. So um, this notion of the turn value of the gun, and here, here's the thing, in all these massacres we've had, you know, tragically, there were, there were policemen with guns at Columbine, they didn't stop them. There were shooters at South Centers, you know, uh, who was trying to stop the, the shooting at the South Center um, shopping mall a couple years ago. He was hiding behind a pillar. You cannot stop it's very difficult to stop somebody intent on doing harm with a gun. Thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. It just happened today in Canada. It may it happen. literally happened today in Canada. It doesn't happen I mean, that often, though. That's not true. It's simply not true. It happens, it happens according to the CDC. Guns are used in self-defense cases at least 500,000 times you know, every I, year. I find that laughable that you point to the CDC because the CDC has been precluded by NRA pressure from collecting any agnostic research on gun violence. One, one moment, the CDC please. One, cannot one, one legally second. collect data on gun violence because of NRA pressure. So how can you then use the CDC for supporting your claims? Because the C you love the CDC. I love them, but they're neutered. They've been neuted just like the ATF has been neuted by the, by, so by the NRA. One, one, yeah, second, one, see, second, what, what? one second, please. I want to make sure we have guests here that came to an audience that is not likely to respond positively to what they say. I want to hear what they say, and I want other people to be able to hear what they say. So by all means, be spirited, but keep it short and don't be rude. I want to be able to hear what they have to say because oh, there's a certain amount of bravery to come up in front of hundreds of people and say what they're saying. Thank you. Okay. R Ralph, if, if I can say, one of the problems with the CDC, and I know it was Ben who introduced it, the CDC stands for the Centers for Disease Control. 
one of the things that rubs people the wrong way is gun ownership isn't a disease. It's not contagious. Uh, it's not infectious. It's not destructive. The, the very core issue, and this is why people are getting passionate here, uh, I, I think that Ben and I believe that it's a great thing if our neighbors choose to be responsible gun owners. You seem to have a problem with the no, whole no, no, idea. Just to be clear, with I the think statistics you have the right you to have it. It, I understand, it, it, but you think it's a bad idea. But in other words, you think it's a bad idea for a family to own guns. I think it's a good idea for a family to own oh, guns. And I base that but, on so data persuade driven them. Analysis. Go ahead and persuade them. Well, but here's here's part of the, Ralph. You cited the fact that there that there are not this many break-ins in the United States where you need a gun. One of the reasons is because everybody owns a gun in the United States. If you look at the number of hot break-ins, for example, in the United States versus Britain, half of the break-ins in the in in Britain, in Great Britain, where there is pretty much zero gun ownership. The, the rate of, of robbery when somebody is at home is 50%. 50% of the break-ins occur when somebody is at home because they know they're not going to encounter somebody with a gun. The rate in the United States is 10%. And the, That's because you may open the door and there may be something you don't like on the other side of it. Yeah. And, and, the, and the flip side of that, Ben, and the flip side of that, Ben, is because we have so many guns in this society, we have a, a death rate 19.5 times higher from guns than the average of all of the modern industrialized society. So you've got to look at cost benefit. And I think how effective is a gun as a deterrent? And you're going to have your statistics. We're going to have our statistics. Let's have the CDC. Let's have somebody agnostic. Dr. David Hemingway, the Harvard School of Public Health, he's agnostic. He's collected all the data. You have to look at the people. Okay, we've, we've already gone through this. Washington, D.C. is extraordinarily high. New Hampshire is extraordinarily low. On par with European countries, by the way, in terms of murder rate. Okay, that is the reality. And that's in America, and New Hampshire has an extraordinarily high rate you of gun ownership. You also have to skew it to income, though. Where you're going to have low income, you're going to have h higher inherent gun violence, or any type of violence. So, so again, do you want to discriminate against uh, poor neighborhoods and make sure that there are no guns in poor neighborhoods? And, and, and that the family that wants to defend itself against that very high crime rate is unable to do so? I think... And if, I, I understand that you believe that... And I've heard this statistic many times, and I've also heard a question about you being 22 times more likely to kill a family member or a friend. But the truth is, why don't you let the homeowner decide? Let people choose. You acknowledge that they, we all have a right to own firearms. Michael, there's no argument there. I understand. People have so that allow right. people to choose. Try to persuade them. Don't legislate gun ownership away. And nobody is doing that. I, I, nobody is doing that. Universal background check does nothing to the, law, to the rights of the law-abiding person to buy a gun. What a ceasefire wants to do is help change the culture and let people make the decisions for themselves by giving them the facts. And that also allows your side to, to compete in the marketplace of ideas, that's all. Sure, fine, let the market decide. We, we agree. So then why are we voting on laws? This, <laughs> this, uh, this next question is for Ben Shapiro. Ben, uh, you've said that you believe the fundamental reason for the Second Amendment is preventing government tyranny, not hunting, not self-defense. How, based on the fact that government would have overwhelming force and would still be able to overcome any given family, no matter how many firearms and no matter how much ammo they have, how is that not paranoia? I'm sorry, how is that not? Not paranoia. Well, it's not paranoia in the historical sense in that so many countries have gone tyrannical after being democracies, and the 20th century is pure proof of this. Uh, the idea that, that you should have the ability to defend yourself against a tyrannical government, I think even a lot of folks on the left now are looking and seeing that government has the capacity to violate people's rights on a pretty regular basis. Uh, the, the idea that the government can overwhelmingly quash any sort of popular uprising is not actually factually true. Uh, there, I've, I've, I've spoke with many people at the War College uh, about this particular issue um, because it's a concern. It really is a concern. If there were to be some sort of popular uprising, what exactly the government would do about it? Um, but the reality is this. The, the founders were, were pretty clear on this point. One of the fundamental, the fundamental rationale for the Second Amendment and stated right there in the Second Amendment itself with regard to the Militia Clause, which, which was specifically designed as an organized means of resistance to tyranny from abroad or at home. 
the, the goal of the Second Amendment is to prevent government tyranny. That doesn't mean that it forecloses other uses of the Second Amendment, which includes the right to life, which would be a right to self-defense. It also doesn't foreclose hunting. But to ignore that is to ignore the fundamental basis of why we have a God-given right. If, if we have a, if we have a, if we have a, an individual right to self-defense, we certainly have a collective right to self-defense. Can I, can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. So take me through this scenario. Sure. The people in this room, these gun owners, are creating an arsenal in the event they have to turn those guns on our sons and daughters in uniform? No. Well, they are creating they, those... Well, when, they, when they, well, how is the government going to take over? I assume... Well, I assume, I assume... Okay, you're right. I assume there will the be troops. people who wear uniforms. Okay, right. but I don't believe that and people... And they will be our sons and daughters. And, and well, yes, everybody will yes. be our sons and daughters. And we've raised sons and daughters to follow what clearly would be an unlawful order. I think that there are people. I think to, to ignore the possibility of people following unlawful orders is to ignore the entire history of the last two centuries. Okay, so as long as we're clear about this, what we're talking about, the reason we're gathering these arsenals is to shoot the people we thank for their service in other times. No. That, that well, is then that, who is it? Who, how will the government take over then? People who, are willing to, people who are willing to enforce unlawful orders, and I don't believe the vast majority of people in the army are willing to enforce unlawful well, orders. If, if I can, I, 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 actually, could I actually believe that this is the single most destructive line of reasoning for the pro-gun side. Because once you start talking about civil insurrection, once you talk, start talking about resisting our sons and daughter in uniform, as, um, as Dave rightly cited, once you talk, start talking about civil war in the United States, and by the way, 2014, um, you, you have marginalized yourself. You have. And you're not going to persuade anyone. And just one moment. George Washington, right, personally, personally led the federal army together with Alexander Hamilton to uh, put down a civil rebellion called the Whiskey Rebellion, right? The, the founding fathers convened the Constitutional Convention in reaction to Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts. They did not believe, they did not believe, and neither did Jefferson, the, none of the founding fathers believed that somehow it was a good idea to encourage change with the barrel of a gun. We believe in encouraging change by voting, by political mobilization, and by our elected representatives following the will of the people, not by using firearms for force. Well, this is, this is fun because this never happened. So uh, I want to <laughs> um, so I, I want to delve into this a little bit because I do think it's interesting. Um, I agree with you. It's not a politically expedient argument, which is why nobody makes it, including you. Do you actually disagree with the, with the fundamental notion that, should the, that, that the purpose of the Second Amendment was fear that if the government, which by the way, many of the founders were very afraid of the notion of a standing army, which is why the Constitution was not particularly clear on a standing army. Uh, absolutely right. The, the purpose of the Second Amendment, and I just read Nelson Lund's article, mm -hmm. you, you know his work. I just read it last night, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm up on it. And I reread Federalist 46, mm -hmm. which is uh, James Madison. James Madison writes about one of the reasons that liberty is safer in America in 1787 was because the American people were far more armed than in Great Britain. And there's no question that the purpose of the Second Amendment was to make sure that the federal government, the federal government, had no power to disarm the populace. No question. Uh, th that's not true. There's a new book out called The Second Amendment. I forgot the individual's right. ben, name. Ben had the author on his show. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's great. But, he essentially admitted the but argument. But first of all, there was, no income, the there was no income tax. There was no Secretary of Defense. There was no standing army. The citizenry were, 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 um, were all farmers. Farmers, they didn't really want guns, and the federal government actually made sure that they were ready and armed for battle by urging them actually to have guns so they could they could fight. But one of one of the other things about the Second Amendment, now again, I know this is a sidelight, but it is interesting, and Ben knows this, is that it, it says a well-regulated militia. Militias, there was not a national militia, nor could there be. There was a national army. And the people who were anti-federalists liked the idea that there would be these separate state militias that were rec uh, necessary for the protection of a free state, and that those state militias would serve as a counterbalance to some kind of overweening federal power. Right, so in, in other words, you agree with the argument, you just think 
think it's inconvenient to articulate. No, I, I don't agree with the I don't agree with the argument that we should even begin talking about civil insurrection in 2014. What I do agree with is that the Second Amendment is there to prevent the federal government from disarming the populace. Well, then we, we completely agree, and I, I, I'm not making the case for civil insurrection in 2014, but the bottom line is that we fully agree on the basis of the Second Amendment, because it's clear historically, it's there in the documents, and you mentioned all the documents. Uh, quickly, in defense of Ben, he did say, uh, when he mentioned this, that he was talking about 100, uh, maybe 150 years, so it'd be, you know, 2114 that he was concerned about. I did say that on the, uh, yeah, here's asked me about this. Yeah. Uh, did, uh, Dave Ross, did you want to add something? I, I'll propose a scenario, which I think everybody would support. In the event that uh, ISIS decided to make good on his threats and parachuted a brigade of, I don't know, a thousand people to run roughshod through neighborhoods, I don't think they'd get far. I do, I, I actually do, I, I actually do want to ask a general you're, question here. You're does, overloading does, Dave does, Ross, he's had two incidents of applause this evening. Yeah. <laughs> Just because this is an interesting, here. just because this is interesting, more than anything else, out of intellectual curiosity, is everybody basically willing to concede that the American government, at no point at any time in the future, will ever start en encroaching on the rights of Americans? Is that the idea here? No, no, no Ben. But what I am, what I am, uh, find it necessary arguing, to affirm arguing in 2014 is, that is the, not the same as saying that we the, need the, the guns way, for the, a purpose. The, uh, see, this is where I disagree with you. I do not believe that the founders wanted, or that we should want, or favor that the idea that if the federal government begins encroaching on the rights of the Americans. The, you don't resist it with firearms. You resist it with political activism, and you resist it by changing the government. I fully agree. And then if it doesn't work, and <laughs> and then then if it then if it doesn't work, basically uh, we're we are we're all we're screwed. screwed. <laughs> yeah, because look, it, it is it is absolutely true. I mean, uh, if the the notion. The, the sort of the fantasy of Red Dawn, which was a lousy movie both times, both times. Don't hate on Patrick Swayze, dude. Yeah, all right, I know. I was about to say, those the, are fighting the, that, words, that, that, is, that is not a healthy fantasy for uh, liberals, moderates, conservatives, or okay. anyone else to indulge. I don't understand why saying that something needs to be available in case of eventuality is a fantasy about it. I own a gun, and should somebody break into my house, I don't fantasize about someone breaking into my house so I have to shoot them in the face. No, sure you do. And, and by the way, and that's reasonable. And, and shooting people in the face is a reasonable way of resisting violence in your home. And Jack, but, coming but to shooting, my door is a Yeah, but shooting police officers officers is not a, a reasonable way of affirming your rights from a federal encroachment. I fully agree, unless they are doing something so wildly egregious. I mean, you agree with this too, Michael. I mean, the idea that the government can never, ever, possibly ever do anything in a democracy... Okay, okay so Ben, Ben, let me, yes. let, me, let me play Dave's role here for a minute. Uh, construct a scenario. What, what is the government doing where you think it is right for a popular, uh, for a popular insurrection against a uh, uniformed personnel? Okay, the government is coming to people's homes and dragging them away on the basis of religious persuasion to jail. Okay, and you, and you believe that at that point, how would this civil insurrection work? I'm not planning on organizing it at the moment. <laughs> I don't fantasize about it. <laughs> but, yeah, may may I just suggest... I mean, am I supposed to like get out my risk pieces or what? No. I, <laughs> <laughs> Diplomacy pieces. <laughs> may, I, I've actually had the, uh, the privilege of attending a couple of um, actual revolutions in uh, Czechoslovakia, in uh, uh, East and West Berlin, and in the uh, old Soviet Union. And what happened in those countries, and I think what happened here, is that rather than shoot on their own people, members of the army would defect and would not carry out those orders because we've raised our kids right. And we have no problem, right? Right. Ralph, you seem to be chomping at the bit to say something. But no, then I, actually, back. I love it when Michael and Ben kind of go at it because... <laughs> And it's Ben's asteroid theory, you know, going forward. But they're, right. they're so smart, but sometimes it gets out there. Quick, uh, quick correction for the Cultural Crusader. Uh, Red Dawn was not an insurrection. It was against the Soviets. Soviets, that's correct. And correct. Uh, the Cubans, and I believe the Communist Chinese. 
Uh, no, North Koreans. North Koreans. They not, changed not it. Not the Chinese. The, the original That's version correct. they had, they, it was Chinese, and then they were pressured. No, they couldn't get Chinese distributors, so they cut it. That was the Red Dawn switch to the North Koreans so they could get into the Chinese movie market. <laughs> Child of the 80s has to defend Red Dawn. All right. <laughs> back, uh, back to our question. I don't even remember who uh, it was supposed to be addressed to. But I'm going to go with Ralph because uh, he's been quiet for, while, for quite a while here. This is from the New York Times, September 12th uh, this year. Uh, they said, more than 20 years of research funded by the Justice Department has found that programs to target high-risk people or places rather than targeting certain kinds of guns can reduce gun violence. Then they cite black men amount to only 6% of the population, yet of the 30 Americans on average shot each day, one half are black males. Doesn't this suggest that a dramatic reduction in violence, particularly violence using firearms, might come from addressing cultural and socioeconomic issues, not firearms? I, I don't think it's either or. You know, I think we use every means possible, and I think, um, I think the, the perfect opportunity there is to have job creation in these uh, lower income groups. I think wherever you have vocational training and you give these people jobs and hopes you're going to see a reduction in gun violence. But I don't, there's so many things we can do. It gets back to this. We need a holistic solution. We need to address mental illness. We need to uh, address uh, giving some um, minority groups hope. Uh, we need to have job creation. And if people believe and they're confident, then they're not going to be shooting each other. So it's not either or. Well, it's, well, it's here, here's the problem with holistic solutions. They usually end with nothing getting done. Uh, it's a, so like, we shouldn't try. No, so we should no, just no, get no, up no, and no. Go home and say 32,000 no, gun deaths a year is acceptable collateral damage, and let's not even try universal background no, no, checks. No, no, precisely the opposite. Because the truth is that you're not pursuing a holistic solution. You're pursuing a very specific solution and to you're a still very against holistic that. problem. Because I don't think that your specific solution is the most well tailored solution then to what, the problem. And that goes back. What would your solution be to have an all the things that step? we've already agreed on on this stage multiple times, from mental illness to longer to longer sentences for crime to yes, job growth in the and, minority and the, community the by private sector. If you deny if I, gun rights to the mentally ill, they then have the opportunity to go to a gun show and buy a gun anyhow. So you can't deny gun rights to the mentally ill if you have a situation where 40% of all gun purchases are gone through gun shows and on the internet. Uh, okay, one of the things, you want to know something else that we can do is, is recognize what has worked in the United States of America. The greatest unheralded American success story has been the reduction in the national crime rate. It's unprecedented. It's phenomenal. I mean, you can do the math, and if you talk about black males who are the most at-risk population as victims of violent crime, there are more than 100,000 a hundred thousand black males who are alive today who would have died if we had the same crime rate that we had in 1993. Things have gotten vastly, vastly better. Tell that Why? to a black male. I mean, it, it, it is... I, I do, all the time. And it's rough as hell for them. Okay, rough it's, as hell it, getting jobs. It's, still, yeah, it's, it's certainly still too rough, but let's recognize how we've succeeded. We've succeeded because of better policing. Police departments and police officers deserve all the support and all the credit in the world. And one of the things that is going on in this country right now seems to be a demonization of the police. When you have people on MSNBC saying that she is more afraid of her local police than she is of ISIS and Ebola combined, that is a problem. Police are the good guys and we ought to acknowledge it. Ralph, you look like you wanted to. Well, my, my comeback to that is we're trying to help the police here. We've got FBI data for 10 years that says universal background checks um, are going to significantly reduce the 500 gun deaths of, from, by the police by firearms, and yet we've got walk cops that's against this. So, you know, it's a kind of a self-defeating crazy thing. Why would police, when after you've had Timothy Brenton, after you've had the four police officers in Lakewood, and you had a number of these incidents, be against a common sense measure when you have 50 police killed a year, and we know from FBI statistics that uh, those states that have background checks in place have a 39% lower rate of police killed by firearms. 
Well, it's in 30. I mean, there's one of the reasons that many police officers are against these sorts of situations if they feel that it will deprive law-abiding people of their guns is because police recognize better than anybody that they are, in essence, a responsive force. Having a gun in your home is not responsive. I mean, the fact is that it takes the police, even in the best areas, like Gross Point, 3.4 minutes to get to the scene of a crime. I, I don't that's think a that's long it, time. Ben. I think the NRA is. I know a, they is, think is, that because I've been. And I respect that brotherhood, and I think a lot of police by culture are part of that brotherhood, so they don't want to go against their fellow, fellow I, brothers at their own... Ralph, I know this is uh, the case, because uh, um, my next-door neighbor, somebody attempted to break into my next-door neighbor's house. They, they, they attempted to break in with a crowbar. The, the only person who was home was my friend's wife. And the, and the police came, and they asked her, do you have a gun in the home? Which is a normal question. They ask that always. And she said, yes, I have a shotgun. They said, next time you hear somebody using a crowbar to open your door, go and clear the chamber. Yeah. Right? Because then the person will hear the, the chamber being cleared and they will run. It was a pump shotgun. I think the Vice President of the United States gave the same advice. Yeah. <laughs> So you got a paranoid state, like, you know, and you're going to have happen what happened in Okanagan five years ago, where you had a professor from the School of Visual Arts go in the wrong motel room, you know, after a wedding, and there's some guy there with a shotgun on the bed, and as soon as that door opened three inches, he blew the guy away. So it works both ways. Yeah, would a background check have prevented that? No, but we're talking about a, a, a culture. What type? This all goes to the type of culture we want to be in. And, if, and you guys are talking about this paranoid culture where the boogeyman is always at the door, and if you've got a gun, you're safer. When the statistics from agnostic research groups say, we are not safer. When the statistics show that we have, a, we have 32,000 deaths that are almost 20 times higher rate of, of death than any other industrialized society, when most of those countries look at our gun issue and they go, what is wrong with America? I what have, is wrong with America? I think, let me, I'm, I'm curious though, do we agree? Uh, I have no problem with uh, you defending your home. I have no problem with me defending my home. I would, uh, I would kill somebody to defend my family. I, I think most of us would, even though that's actually uh, against my uh, faith. But if you make a mistake and you kill the 13 year old trick or treater, you need to be punished, right? Yeah, of okay. course. Then I got no beef. Yeah. If okay, I have, you can, I have, you can one have guns final, in your home, Dave but if Ross my has kid the final, won't. Dave Ross has the final word here, but I have one final question, and that is this. Uh, will you please thank our two liberal panelists specifically for coming to the event? The panelists, uh, the panelists will be in the lobby if you still want to get photos or if you have additional questions, unless, of course, they retreat very swiftly. <laughs> but uh, there's so many of you, you can surround them and pepper them with questions uh, if you wish. Uh, final round of I'm applause. I'm just for peppering all with any of them. Never mind. <laughs> for all panelists, thank you so much for coming out, and thank you, each panelist, for making this uh, a spirited evening. Thank you, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we kept it civil. Yeah. yeah.